I have a presentation here to talk about uh, contextual awareness solutions that our team has been building uh, with various products that we have in uh, ST Micro's portfolio. Uh, so I'm part of the team that builds these solutions around the accelerometers, gyroscopes, microphones, you know, environmental sensors like pressure sensor, all of those. So we have you know, existing things that we have all around us, you know, devices that can interact with human beings. We, the devices such as mobile phones and trackers that we use. And what we essentially are you know, trying to do is to put solutions together which recognize the context. Uh, your watch on your wrist is a device that gives you the context, the time. Or uh, your uh, GNSS system in your car gives you the context, your location. And then after that, what you know, is done is you take action, and which is where you know, your magic is, which means you can build solutions around context that can be provided to you. So there are diverse applications in all kinds of domains. You know, smart me, you know, your fitness trackers, starting with that, <laughs> to smart home, uh, the one that uh, very intelligently manages the energy consumption in the home, to smart office, to industrial application, healthcare application, fitness, gaming, virtual and augmented reality applications, and list goes on and on. Uh, now, uh, with a lot of work that is being done in the area of uh, human-machine interaction uh, with machine learning algorithms, which, with deep learning, there are so many more applications that suddenly become possible. I will talk a little bit more about uh, all of these uh, in, this, um, you know, in this talk. Uh, so, you know, I'll start with some examples. Some examples for healthcare applications. So if you can uh, just consider a simple device like an accelerometer, it can monitor periodicity in acceleration and thereby you can determine if the person is walking or running or jogging or stationary. So this essentially has been, you know, utilized by many companies that commercially sell uh, fitness trackers. Uh, you can also imagine applications, context-aware applications, that can actively support elderly or disabled people in performing their everyday activities. Uh, you can you know, work with systems that can potentially detect a potentially dangerous situations in a person's life, like a you know, man-down application, like if a person has fallen down, to be able to detect that a person has fallen down and send help uh, based on the location of that person is one such application. Industrial applications, there are quite a few. Uh, you know, some examples are like you can make activity-aware applications that can support workers in their tasks. If you can imagine putting together the electronics in a cockpit of um, a Boeing 787 aircraft, it has so much of electronics in it, and the sequence that you need to follow in putting all of those components together, uh, if uh, the environment around you can monitor what the user has been, you know, what the worker in that cockpit has been working on and uh, show the worker an appropriate user manual because things are so complex now. Show the user an appropriate uh, user manual based on the step in the assembly process that they're at. This is another one of those applications that can benefit workers in industrial applications. Entertainment and game. Uh, so, you know, now with uh, motion memes, uh, accelerometers and gyroscopes and magnetometers that you can wear on the body, you know, different locations on the body. Feedback can be provided to athletes or to performing artists uh, on their performance. Like um, in case of uh, the golf club swing, there are applications that are available that, you know, essentially can help the user improve their golf club swing. And those are all using motion MEMS. Uh, there are many other applications, like, you know, there are, you can already see trends where context-aware applications can do mood recognition and, you know, bring up the appropriate playlist. Uh, so you can imagine that as uh, one of those uh, situations where contextual awareness really helps the application. Uh, to understand the context, uh, you know, there are, you know, few things that we just also go through here. The real value is in recognition of high-level context. So uh, what do I mean by that? <laughs> if you recognize that the person is you know, in a shopping mall and is shopping uh, versus person having lunch with friends at the shopping mall, those two are two different things. And the context here is different. Versus a person that's uh, busy at office doing their work at their desk. 
So this is high-level context. Now, high-level context is built on determining low-level context components. And those low-level context components, the more accurately you can determine those, you can have a very good estimate of high-level context with a greater degree of accuracy and reliability. So the low-level context you can imagine are like human activity, human environment, human location, human interaction. So human activity is like, you know, you can imagine person is walking or stationary or person is sitting at their desk. Um, human environment, you know, am I in a conference room or am I, uh, you know, in a shopping mall? That's the human environment. Human location, again, the same thing. Uh, and human interaction, you know, is the person talking to another person or is the person typing on the keyboard? All of these can be detected. Uh, so let me just then, you know, with that, present a generic context awareness architecture. So this is, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff on this, but what I want to describe is everything starts with data or signal, which is the outermost layer here. So, you know, your signal could be the, uh, generated by an accelerometer or a compass or a microphone or any radio signals like your GNSS or, you know, from camera or your light sensor, even clock provides you uh, you know, the data or the signal. So now you take this data or signal and then, you know, this goes through the information layer. So you would take the accelerometer data and try to extract information from it, you know, information such as periodicity in the acceleration pattern. Or, you know, you can look at variance in acceleration, which determines, you know, what is the user doing. So then, you know, this can be movement pattern. From microphones, you can determine noise patterns. From radio signals such as GPS or Wi-Fi, you can determine your lo user location. Uh, camera can give you brightness. Clock can give you your time, date and time. And they you know, also provide you calendar or activity list. So now from the information layer, you go through the information processing, which utilizes uh, these pattern repositories. Pattern repositories are the ones that have been built where uh, you know, a lot of uh, analysis has been done on the data, like what does the acceleration pattern look like when a person is walking? Or what does the acceleration pattern look like when your mobile phone is sitting on the dashboard of a car? So all of that sits in a pattern repository. So this information layer, you know, essentially uh, will do information processing and convert this information into knowledge. And what does that mean? What it means is if I take the movement pattern, I can convert that into a movement tag. So looking at the acceleration pattern, I can say the person is walking. So that's a movement tag. Similarly, from microphone, you can say noise tag. You know, am I in an environment which is that of a conference room? Uh, same thing for uh, location. You know, again, you can create a location tag. You know, this is a location corresponding to Santa Clara Convention Center. All of this goes into the context detection service. And context detection service is, of course, driven by a context repository where you can combine information from uh, multiple sources. And ultimately, you know, you generate the context, and which is serviced through context APIs. So taking this, you know, and applying that to human beings, you know, what we want to do now is to understand human activity. So human activity, you know, if you look at here on the right-hand side here is your time scale. You know, it can go from seconds to minutes to hours. And it can be broken down into multiple such components. The very first one is, uh, you know, motifs or gestures or movements. Those are on the order of seconds. So, you know, you can distinguish uh, activities such as, you know, bending the arm or taking a step. Those are the activities that fall in the first class. The second one is low-level activities. So you can put together, you know, uh, pieces, of, pieces of information from the first set to create low-level activities where you can determine the person is walking or person is cleaning the windows. And then you combine these and go to the higher level activities which can result in determining what is the person doing. Like, you know, person is, you know, on his desk, you know, typing on the keyboard or person is shopping at the mall. So those could be of the order of hours. So how exactly do you, you know, make this happen with, you know, some of these sensors? So I'll start with some examples of that. So for human motion detection, here is, you know, an architecture that can be utilized. You can start with, um, you know, a variety of sensors. And these sensors are like accelerometer, pressure sensor, gyroscope, or a microphone. And the 
information from accelerometer or pressure sensor or gyroscope or a microphone is processed through some windowing and feature extraction scheme. So you would look at a window of a two seconds worth of data or three seconds worth of data or half a second worth of data. You do feature extraction. What it means is that you would obtain your mean or variance or number of peaks in that signal uh, or you know, time difference between two different peaks. All of that is feature extraction. So once you, ha you, know, you can look at the acceleration signal coming in, goes through windowing and feature extraction. Through this process, once you have the features available to you, you can compute the probability of a set of activities that are you know, possible to be detected through acceleration signal. Now, you can do the same with other sensors, but you can, in this case, also combine them. Accelerometer and pressure sensor can be combined. The information from these two sensors can be combined. They're complementary in nature. Uh, you know, same thing, accelerometer, pressure sensor, gyroscope can be combined. If you want to determine the orientation, you know, you can combine accelerometer and gyroscope. If you want to determine the context of the person, is the person walking or person climbing stairs, that can be done by combining accelerometer and pressure sensor. Pressure sensor gives you variation in the altitude. And then, you know, of course, can combine microphone. It's fairly simple because, you know, let's say a person is walking in a corridor, so the periodicity that you know, the microphone can detect in person's steps can be combined that with the accelerometer. And you can improve the accuracy of determination of context through these signals. So this was the motion. Now what about human environment? You know, human beings, you know, for example, in this conference room, you know, how do you determine that the person is in a conference room? So same thing, you, know, you look at microphone data, you can uh, you know, process that microphone data through some windowing and feature extraction scheme. Based on the features that you extract, you know, those features could be like MFCCs or delta MFCCs, whatever they may be. And you, know, you can compute the probability for your environment features. Uh, and in our framework that we have put together, what I want to uh, show you is what are those possibilities. So for motion activity vector, you can imagine a vector that looks like this here, uh, where you know, your activity could be stationary or walking, jogging. You know, person could be on escalator, elevator. Person could be on a bicycle or driving, or none of this. So the most important characteristic of this is that you know, each of these elements in the vector, they're sort of mutually exclusive. You cannot be stationary and walking at the same time. Only one thing can happen at a given point of time. You cannot be bicycling and driving at the same time. You're either bicycling or driving. For voice activity, you know, here are some examples. You, know, you could have a situation like silence, or face-to-face -face conversation, or a person talking on the phone, or none of this. So none of this is you know, a class which can be expanded. You can uh, you know, put more and more as you have greater number of sensors that are available to you. Same thing for uh, your spatial environment. You can have uh, spatial environment detection, like are you uh, on a street? Are you in a stadium? Or uh, is the person in a retail environment, like you know, shopping mall or uh, cafeteria or restaurant? Or is the person at home? Is the person in a moving vehicle? All of this. And then you, know, you have none of these. So based on the richness of algorithms, none of this essentially can be as small as you want it to be. So uh, for these three vectors that you can determine at any given point of time, what do you ultimately want to do with it? So what you want to do is to combine the time sequences of the probabilities for each of these vectors to ultimately determine and produce a soft decision. Because remember, in these uh, elements, you, know, you can assign a probability at any given point of time. So the element that has the highest probability is your actual activity. So the, let's say you know, the person is walking. Your vector would as essentially contain probabilities for all of these elements, but the one that corresponds to walking will be the highest. Since this is probabilistic, it is different from hard context. This is soft context. So you would have vectors like motion activity vector, voice activity vector, or spatial environment vector. You can combine all of these to ultimately determine high-level context. So some um, you know, notions on what does it take to build a good solution. 
So you know, number one is you know, the solution should be accurate when you're trying to predict the context. And how can you achieve greater degree of accuracy? When you put the solution together, you, know, you should conduct testing with very large number of users for diverse scenarios. So goes without saying, but you know, I just wanted to list them here. The solution should be low power. Uh, the, you know, if um, you need to keep charging your device every few hours, the user experience is not all that good. Uh, so smart sensor usage, use of hardware acceleration, and uh, you know, if possible, do all the computations on the sensor itself. Again, another attribute for uh, a good solution is low footprint. The solution should not basically require a large uh, computing resource because many of these solutions are implemented on devices that are like mobile phones or wearable devices that have limited battery life and limited computing power. Well, I shouldn't say limited. Nowadays, you know, mobile phones have eight processors in them. But the thing is, battery life is still a finite amount, and you would want to extend that as much as possible. And uh, you know, flexible. You know, flexible means that you should be able to implement your solution on a variety of platforms. Uh, contextual awareness implemented on a mobile phone, uh, you know, you should also be able to implement some piece of it on your wearable device or on your tablet or your uh, laptop, whatever the you know, device may be that you're carrying, which has sensors plus computing capability with it. Uh, one of the other important aspects of this is personalization. Um, the way I ride my bicycle is different from you know, how somebody else would be riding their bicycle. And to improve the accuracy of detection, if uh, we put together algorithms that allow you for personalization or for tuning of parameters that improves the performance, then it's always a very good idea because the user experience is enhanced when you have capability of personalization in, a, in your uh, framework, in your algorithms, in your architecture. So we basically have a variety of um, solutions that are available. Uh, and these are available um, on uh, open.mems. Uh, these are available for free, essentially. Uh, so some examples of this, I'm listing them here. So they can be used to create your own complete solution. So the very first one is uh, you know, sensor fusion uh, for device orientation. You can combine accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer data to determine the orientation of the device, to determine um, linear acceleration, to compute your quaternions, uh, to determine the calibration status as to how well are your sensors calibrated. Another one that we have is a user activity recognition library, which can work for both mobile or wrist-worn cases. It will determine travel mode, like is the person uh, riding a bicycle, is the person walking, is the person a pedestrian, or is the person in a vehicle. Uh, we also have uh, you know, uh, features where it can count uh, squats or push-ups or bicep curls. You know, we have features like that that are available on open.mems. Uh, gesture recognition, there's, that's another library that's available. It can form a building block for the, your contextual awareness framework. And this gesture recognition library can uh, detect glance, like you, know, you pick up your phone and look at it, or uh, uh, you uh, shake the device, you swipe it, you rotate it. So your device can be used as a remote control, uh, essentially. So if your mobile phone can detect this orientation, I can use that to turn the volume on or off. Um, pose determination. Uh, it can detect, you know, this library can help you determine whether the person is standing or sitting or lying down. And carry position determination library. So this library can help you determine if the mobile phone is in your pocket or in your handbag or in the holster or the trouser pocket, backpack, uh, so these scenarios uh, can be utilized in building better contextually aware solution. So some more, uh, you know, stairs. You know, you can count the number of steps the person has taken while counting, uh, while uh, climbing up the stairs. So this library will uh, only count steps when you are climbing stairs. Uh, it would also detect, you know, if you are on an elevator or escalator. It would uh, you know, be able to uh, determine the floor change. We have a library that does bicep curl detection and counting. Uh, we have um, you know, a solution that we have put together which gives you situational awareness, combining audio and motion memes. 
So this is for environment detection. You know, we are eventually going to add things like keyword spotting to it and uh, number of speakers that you might have in a conference room. And uh, we have uh, a demo here. Uh, in fact, many of these are being demoed uh, here on the show floor. We have a demo for pedestrian dead reckoning. So this is a solution which can enable indoor positioning through use of uh, motion and environmental sensors. So to talk a little bit more about our OSX motion FX, this is a library that's available from open.mems. Uh, it combines uh, the data from three sensors, magnetometer, pressure sensor, and accelerometer. And uh, you know, would give you quaternions, you know, can give you your magnetic heading, will give you your pitch roll and your angles or your linear acceleration or your gravity component. It has built in uh, your uh, magnetic calibration library. It has gyro bias compensation built in. Uh, it has a uh, dynamic distortion feature built in, which means you know, the hand jitter uh, you know, is already compensated for. Uh, and uh, you know, the library is fairly efficient, so it can be implemented on mobile phones or even wrist-worn devices, uh, where the computational requirement for this is not that large. So this is, again, available on open.mems. So open.mems essentially has uh, many of these libraries where you can uh, look at the doc documentation which describes the APIs. It has test results, uh, you know, how it has been tested, how to put this together, and some uh, tips on putting this together. Uh, we have activity recognition library that I talked about, you know, it, OSX Motion AR. It will provide real-time information on whether the person is stationary or walking or fast walking, jogging, biking, driving. The feature about this particular library that you know, we talk about most is that you know, it uses only accelerometer data and at 16 hertz rate. So it's a very power efficient implementation because you know, it essentially <laughs> consumes uh, the smallest possible amount of current for accelerometer. And uh, some test results for this uh, you know, are you know, available through this confusion matrix that I want to show you. So about 70, we tested this library with 71 unique individuals. We have 48 hours of activity data in this. And the confusion matrix here shows this is the classification output, and this is the actual class, you know, uh, activity that the user was engaged in. And what you see here is that most of the activities, such as you know, stationary walking, fast walking, or jogging, it's better than 90% accuracy. For uh, biking and driving, it's uh, better than you know, 83 or 86% accuracy. Uh, we have tested this library for use cases like you know, the device was in the cup holder in the car or in the shirt pocket, or you know, the device was in trouser pocket. In case of bicycle, we had the device in um, shirt pocket or in the trouser pocket, many such scenarios. It has been tested. Um, and the aspect that I want to emphasize here is that this is primarily accelerometer only. So if you remember the architecture that we had put together, you, know, you can combine accelerometer and pressure sensor, gyroscope, and microphone, and you can further improve this. But what we are showing you here is that the level of accuracy achieved with just accelerometer, which is sampled at the lowest possible sample rate of 16 hertz. We have a gesture recognition library uh, based on, you know, designed using machine learning algorithms. It can detect things like glance, pick up, wake up kind of gestures. Uh, again, ag available on open.mems. APIs for this are available, uh, fairly easy to understand and use. Uh, carry position library, OSX motion CP. It can detect whether the device is on the desk or in hand, like, you know, if you're te texting or near the head, like as if you're talking on the phone, shirt pocket, trouser pocket, arm swing. Um, it's, again, driven by only accelerometer and uh, has been put together using machine learning algorithms. We have uh, pose determination, which can distinguish um, like uh, standing or sitting or lying down. It uses two sensors, a pressure sensor at 10 hertz rate and accelerometer data at 16 hertz rate. So, the reason why we bring in a pressure sensor is to distinguish lying down uh, kind of use case scenario and to improve the accuracy of detection when you want to distinguish between sitting and standing. Uh, the performance latency for this thing is less than two seconds, so fairly um, fast response. So some of the you know, uh, scenarios in which we have collected data for this uh, you know, include uh, like when the person is standing with their hands in their trouser pocket and standing, or head resting on the hand, like sitting down. <laughs> uh, 
hand resting on the side of the couch while watching television. So we, essentially what I'm trying to say here is very diverse use case scenarios and a very large number of users uh, that have contributed to collecting the data for this. So in this case, our probability of detection for sitting is about 97%, and probability of detection for standing is about 88 or 89%. Uh, this essentially um, is uh, one of those libraries uh, that, again, just like any other library, uh, you can try it out on our nuclear board or our sensor tile. Uh, the APIs and the you know, information that is available to you to uh, integrate it is fairly self-explanatory. Then vertical context determination library. So this is where you can distinguish is the person on an elevator or escalator, is the person taking stairs, climbing up the stairs, going down the stairs, is the person walking on the same floor? Because if you uh, notice, uh, you know, these solutions are built with pressure sensors. And pressure sensors uh, have inherent uh, phenomena that you, know, you need to take into account. Uh, one example is if you're standing um, near an air conditioning duct, and if the air conditioning kicks in, you know, it will show a spike in pressure. So the algorithm has to be smart enough to distinguish that the person is on the same floor and that the floor change did not occur when the air conditioning kicks on. Or if you walk in and if you open the door, or if you walk in into building, that is uh, air conditioned. So at, when you enter the door, you know, you, there's a change in pressure. So that change in pressure should not be, you, you know, it should, the, the algorithm should be smart enough to know that you're on the same floor, that your floor or your altitude did not change. Uh, we have another library, interesting library for uh, you know, fitness kind of use case scenario, which is bicep curl counting. It uses a pressure sensor and an accelerometer and um, you know, samples them at, again, 25 hertz rate. Uh, and it will count, it will detect bicep curls. You know, this is for, of course, the case where the device is worn on your wrist. And it will detect uh, bicep curls, and it will count the number of repetitions. Uh, so uh, a, a library that, again, is based on machine learning algorithms and uh, can be tried out uh, using a nuclear board or sensor tile. So if you have to build your own application, uh, you know, you can start to do that in less than five minutes, <laughs> essentially. So these libraries are available, um, and uh, Android and iOS apps are available for GUI. So you know, here is an example here. Um, so essentially, if you take your sensor tile and um, you know, run this app uh, on your uh, Android device, what you notice here is essentially uh, your temperature measurements, your pressure measurements, your humidity measurements. It, this one doesn't have a light sensor, so it says not present. So you can essentially, with the available apps, you can put your solution or your proof of concept, if you want to call it, together very, very quickly. You can put this together in about five minutes. So uh, the hardware components that you need to put this together. So there are two choices. Uh, you can choose either the nuclear board or you can choose a sensor tile. These are all available from st.com. So Gerbers are available for both of these. Uh, BOM is available. Schematics are available. So if, if the solution works out for you, you can uh, take components from the schematics uh, that are available for these devices and use them in your own design. Uh, you can then download the firmware from open.mems. So uh, you essentially, for the hardware abstraction layer and for the, the layer that sits uh, on the top, you have the source code available. There are application notes available. There are user guide that's available to you and uh, you know, something that can help you get started. Uh, then you can download any of these libraries, like uh, Activity, or Carry, or Gesture, you know, many of these that I have talked about. Uh, and there is a simple click-through license that is available to you, which allows you to test it, you know, build your proof of concept with it. Uh, if you uh, essentially like this thing, uh, and you know, want to go to production with this library, that's also available to you, as long as you use ST's uh, sensor solution. Uh, this uh, license is given to you for free. So production Lua is provided to you once uh, you, know, you determine uh, you know, the use cases. Uh, the library for your use case works the way you want it to work. Then you essentially you install your app. You know, you can, you know, fundamental things that you can do is you know, data logging or viewing the output, like for OSX Motion FX, uh, which is your um, library for sensor fusion. In real time, you can look at your pitch, roll, and yaw angles. You can uh, obtain your, you know, you can look at your quaternion values. You, we have a cube demo which will show you the movement of the cube in a three-dimensional space for, you know, your testing. 
You can test it for you know, rapid acceleration, or you can test it for a known amount of rotation that you apply uh, to the device. Uh, so essentially, you have the ability to put your uh, complete solution together using these building blocks. Uh, you know, then the other piece that we have here is, of course, your STM32 Nucleo board. This is the hardware piece that I talked about. You know, this is one option. So the STM32 Nucleo board essentially has, uh, you know, many of these features uh, that are helpful in building uh, your uh, actually proof of concept. So it has a you know flexible board power supply. You know, we can power it through USB or external source. It has you know two push buttons and two LEDs. You know, gives you it provides you means to actually inter interact with your algorithms to do testing with this. Um, you know, and what you see here is um, Arduino extension connectors. What it allows you to do is to stack up different shields to bring in different pieces of hardware, so you can create your own proof of concept or your application using a variety of sensors or microphones, or if you want to bring in. Bluetooth low energy to do any of the BLE kind of applications. Then, you know, essentially what the heart of this thing is your STM32 microcontroller, uh, and you can pick the flavor of STM32 that you're interested in. That, you know, STM32 L4 is a very popular flavor, which is a very low power consumption microcontroller. And uh, essentially, using this, uh, you have access to all your uh, MCU IOs. So, you know, if you want to um, write your own logic and do your first testing, you know, this Nucleo board provides you the hardware environment to do this. Uh, this is an example of a shield. So this is the, your sensor shield. It has a three-axis uh, accelerometer and a three-axis gyro gyroscope on it. So LSM60S3 and DS0 are available. Two, two flavors of this sensor shield are available. Then a magnetometer, LIS3MDL, a pressure sensor, LPS25HP, and a humidity and a temperature sensor. Uh, so this essentially can be plugged on to top of the nucleo board. Once you put these two pieces together, then you are ready to try out your, any of your libraries like you know, carry position, sensor fusion, gesture recognition, uh, any of those that you know, we have available on open.mems uh, pertaining to motion or environmental mems. Um, so now the other option that we have is sensor tile. What sensor tile has uh, you know, multiple components on, on it as well. So it has uh, your you know, motion MEMS, it has accelerometer and gyro combination, has environmental uh, sensors such as the pressure sensor on it. So uh, the LSM60SM, this is our latest six axis sensor solution. LSM303AGR, this is our accelerometer and magnetometer combo chip. Uh, you have a, a pressure sensor, LPS22HB, on this sensor tile. Uh, sensor tile is, you can see the form factor is uh, suitable for variable applications. It's uh, uh, 13 millimeters, 13 and a half millimeters by 13 and a half millimeters in dimensions. Uh, it has a MEMS microphone on it. Uh, it's a three by four uh, digital microphone. And you have your STM32 L4 microcontroller on it, which you know, provides you the computational platform. And for connectivity, you have blue energy. So a complete solution, which is, again, available to you. It has an SD card slot for extra memory, which is where if you want to log data you know, while walking, running, jogging, whatever, you know, or audio data for any of your use case scenarios, you can log all of that. And fairly easily programmable. So all of the information that is needed and all of the components that you need, like open.audio, open.mems, open.rf, they will utilize this as a platform and building block for contextual awareness. So uh, you know a little bit more about our uh, free software licensing. So the idea is, uh, as long as ST components are used, uh, the license to any of these, open.mems, open.audio, or open.rf is available to you. You can do proof of concept. And then you know, if you want to go to production with it, you can get a production license for this as well. Uh, open.mems, as you know, this is one snapshot from the web page <laughs> uh, on st.com where you know, you, this is an example where it shows your mo uh, motion AR and motion CP kind of libraries. So you can see all the detail from this. You can order hardware and uh, download software from this. So here is a list of the various libraries that are available to you, like motion GR for gesture recognition, FX for sensor fusion, carry position, pedometer, activity recognition, and so on and so forth. So the idea essentially is, as I have uh, already mentioned, is to combine uh, components from all these three. You can combine open, you know, 
pieces that you find on op uh, open.mems, open.rf, or open.audio, you know, all within the open.framework uh, structure that we have put together to you know, create your own um, proof of concepts or you know, test environments for your own ideas for contextual awareness. Uh, so, you know, this is a little bit more. We have also uh, our ST Blue Microsystem Framework, which puts many of these components together and also adds connectivity to it. So, uh, ST Blue MS is the one that will combine uh, connectivity piece plus sensor fusion with it. So, this is a screenshot from your mobile phone, which essentially is communicating with your sensor tile, and you can run your STM32 cube. You know, you can run your cube demo on this device and actually see the orientation change as you move your uh, cube, uh, as you move your sensor tile. That's it. That's, that was my last slide. <laughs>